All right, we're going to go ahead and get started as the last few people uh, come on into the meeting. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today we're talking about Inspire. So today's webinar is called Inspire, an interactive discussion with industry experts. Uh, we're really excited to have you here. We had a great presentation and conversation last week, and we're going to do the same today. Um, so I'm going to go through and introduce our panelists and some uh, NMA folks that are also on the line, uh, talk to you about our agenda for today, and then I will turn it over to our experts. Um, I'm going to have everyone muted for the meeting. Um, if you um, would like to ask a question, you can go ahead and type it into the chat. Um, we may or may not be able to get to questions. So we asked that folks pre-submitted questions for this webinar because we anticipated we'd have quite a few. Um, and so what we're going to do is at the end of the webinar, we're going to cover all those questions. If we have additional time, um, then I'll go back into the chat and pull some of the questions for folks. So um, if you do have questions and you'd like to get them out there, just go ahead and type them into the chat. Um, and like I said, we'll try to get to your questions if possible. All right, so I'd like to introduce our uh, excellent panel today. So I'll start with myself. Um, I am Samantha Swords. I'm the Senior Manager of Professional Services here at Namikay and Associates, um, and I'm going to serve as the moderator on today's panel. Um, with me, I have Michael Petragallo, who's our Vice President of NMAI, and I'm going to ask Michael to unmute and introduce himself. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we had, as Sam said, we had a fantastic session last week. We're hoping to keep the same flow this week. Uh, and I'm personally very eager after several years of being close to this to be able to now reach out to our, our clients and, and our industry. And thank you so much for joining us. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Um, we also have Andrew DiNicola on the line. He's one of our senior directors. Andrew, do you want to say hello? Good morning. I don't know if I would describe myself as an excellent panelist, but I am on the panel. Uh, I appreciate that, Sam. Uh, as, as Mike said, you know, we've, we've been working with this on and off for the last uh, three years, and and uh, we're kind of excited to see it come to, to, to fruition so, and, and eager to kind of share what we've, what we've learned throughout the process. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and then we have Ashla O'Connor as our final panelist, and she's a manager here at Nam McKay. Hi, thanks, Sam. Hello, everyone. Um, I've been with Nama K for about 12 years now. Over the last couple of years with Michael and Andrew, we've been focusing quite a lot on monitoring uh, the regulatory changes associated with Inspire, and we are definitely looking forward to sharing with you what we've learned so far. Thanks. Um, and then in our audience, uh, we have a couple of NAMI-K inspections experts. And so I just wanted to introduce them in, in case uh, somewhere in the presentation uh, they made any comments or anything so that you knew who they are. So we have Tom Feehan on the line, and he is one of our inspections uh, trainers. And he's an excellent trainer if you've been trained uh, by Nan McKay in uh, inspections and you've been lucky enough to have Tom. I'm sure you've taken a lot of great information from him. So he is on the line. And if you hear him uh, chime in, uh, that's why. And then we also have Morgan Petragallo, who is one of our inspectors on the line as well. Um, and then Cheryl Putnam is our Director of Professional Services. She's on the line as well. She'll be um, working on uh, fielding things in the chat and letting folks into the meeting. So if you have anyone chatting with you, it'll probably be Cheryl. So thanks everyone for being on the line. All right, so let's talk about today's session. Um, so I want to tell you kind of what today's session is and what it isn't. So today's session is not intended as an inspired training course. In other words, there are 63-ish standards, and there's absolutely no way that we're going to be able to cover 63 standards in two hours. So Namike is working on inspired classes for both public housing and HCV that we will roll out, um, and they'll probably be three-day classes. So obviously, we can't cover all of the standards here today. We are, however, going to talk about what the standards look like, how to read a standard, and we will take one of them and break it down for you just so you can kind of see um, the template and the pattern of standards, but it's not a standards training today. What today is, is a discussion with industry experts about where we are in Inspire and where we're going. Um, and the key thing to take away here is it's based on what we know today. 
So Enspire, while it is coming fast, it is still a little bit of a moving target in that we're awaiting publication of a lot of information. So we're waiting for publication of an Inspire final rule and three subordinate notices. What that means in plain English is that the standards are um, not completely done yet. The version that we have um, online right now is not the final, final version that we're gonna be rolling with. Um, the scoring notice, while we have a proposed scoring notice, we don't have a final one yet. And then and, um, administrative procedures for Inspire, all of those are still under development. And so the presentation that we're giving you today is based on what HUD has, HUD has said so far um, on their Inspire website and in get ready sessions and things like that. Um, but just know that a lot of this is still not uh, set in stone. And so things may change in the future, but we want to brief you on what's going on today and what we know up to this point. Okay. And my co-hosts will definitely reiterate that as we go through the, the session. All right, so let me tell you what we're going to talk about today. Um, the first thing is we're going to talk about, well, what is Inspire, right? So that would be a good place to start in the Inspire webinar. Um, and then importantly, we're going to do a comparison of Inspire with HQS and UPCS, right? Inspire is replacing both of those inspection standards. And so what a lot of folks want to know is, well, how is it the same? And really critically, how is it different from those two standards? What do we need to expect? Um, so we'll go through and we'll do a comparison um, with both of those standards. Um, and then we're going to talk about some components of Inspire. So we'll talk about things like the software and scoring um, and how the standards are set up, how you read a standard, those kind of things. So sort of the nitty gritty of the standard itself. Um, then we'll give you some key takeaways for the session. And then we're going to end with a Q&A session. So again, we ask that when folks registered for this, they um, submit questions to us about Inspire, and we took those questions and we put them at the end of the session. Our panel is going to go over those, and then if we have time, like I said, at the end of the session, um, we will try to get some audience questions in as well. All right, and with that, I am going to turn it over to the panel. So let's talk about what Inspire is. Okay. Thank you, Sam. So, all right, not sure who else is super excited to have another acronym. I know I am. So today we're going to talk again about INSPIRE. Basically, it stands for the National Standards for the Physical Inspection of Real Estate. So what does that actually mean? Essentially, this is a new physical inspection model for HUD-assisted housing. And the program was developed by REAC with a focus specifically on aligning multiple inspection protocols under a single set of standards. So as Sam mentioned, ultimately INSPIRE is going to replace housing quality standards for HCV and PVD programs, as well as the uniform physical condition standards for public housing and multifamily programs. So many of you are already familiar with REAC, but for anyone who may not be, REAC is the Real Estate Assessment Center, and this is the department within HUD that is responsible for evaluating the physical condition of properties in which HUD has a financial interest or a monitoring obligation of some sort. In summary, REAC is responsible for overseeing inspections of all of these properties and making sure that they are safe and habitable for residents. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so what are some of the goals of INSPIRE? Ray, why are, why are we now rolling out this new program when we've had other inspection protocols prior to this date? Again, as I've already mentioned, the key goal is to align housing quality expectations across HUD programs. And by aligning these inspection protocols under INSPIRE, HUD hopes to be able to better manage the quality of affordable housing units through stronger standards, better inspections, and greater statistical insights. There's also a greater focus on the health and safety of the residents and less focus on cosmetic conditions of properties. We're going to dig into that a little bit more as we go through this presentation today. So essentially by achieving, um, I'm sorry, by centering the inspectable items and deficiencies on areas that the resident is likely to frequent, they're hoping to achieve that focus on more health and safety um, deficiencies. And then finally, HUD is investing in modernizing its inspection process with an eye on decreasing administrative burden, streamlining the appeals process, and improving service delivery. In order to achieve these goals, the REACT team established a mission, vision, and values for the INSPIRE program. So the mission is to equip REACT, REACT with a transformed, operationally ready line of business that assists their customers in understanding and anticipating risks to the housing portfolios. 
Their vision is for efficient services that maximize customer value. And finally, the values include customer service, trust, accountability, and transparency. You know, continue to see a lot of these themes through each aspect of the Inspire program. Do you think that the React team did a great job of keeping these, the mission, vision, and values in mind as they were designing each of the pieces of the overall Inspire program? In keeping with those goals and in lining with their mission, vision, and values, HUD made a concerted effort to engage numerous stakeholders in the development process. So you can, I'm sure, imagine creating a new inspection model is a massive undertaking. So to develop a well-rounded, well-informed set of standards, HUD engaged various stakeholders through a workshop series, a demonstration program, a soliciting public feedback, and most recently through an Inspired Get Ready series. On the screen right now, you'll see just some of the stakeholders that HUD engaged, including industry experts, third-party vendors, healthy homes, PHAs, as well as owner and agent groups nationwide. So why now? Why are we making this massive shift right when we've had HQS and UPCS for so long? So essentially, Congress directed HUD to align the inspection standards across HUD-assisted properties to address various industry concerns and again, modernize that inspection technology. Some of you may know, the current inspection protocols have not been updated for over 20 years. Under INSPIRE, that will not be the case. HUD has actually baked into the INSPIRE program a continuous improvement model. And that means that every three years, HUD will actually take a step back to review processes, identify any improvement areas, evaluate lessons learned, and then actually integrate that knowledge into future revisions. A key component of the standards are the deficiency rationales. Essentially, these are the basis or the why for each standard. The rationales provide a clear and defensible explanation of the harm or negative result that may occur if that issue were present at a property. There are 14 rationale categories, and some of those are focusing on the resident specifically, like those that are currently on the screen. They cover health, safety, sanitary conditions, security, privacy, usability or operability of items, as well as monetary impact to the resident. The remaining rationales that are on the screen now, these focus more on the property and include maintenance activities, capital costs, potential monetary impact to HUD, structural conditions and market appeal. Again, one key thing to remember is that all inspired efficiencies have an associated health or safety rationale. Again, that's keeping with HUD's goals of emphasizing um, hazards and focusing in on any deficiencies that may impact the health or safety of the resident. And this is one of the um, kind of vehicles that was employed to make that happen. And Michael, I know that the rationales are super important to you and, mm -hmm. and something you're passionate about. So do you wanna speak about those a little bit as well? Absolutely. So I will, of course, touch on a little bit. However, um, when we talk about UPCS, uh, or quite frankly, if we talk about HQS, there was a number of deficiencies that were just there. Uh, it could be you didn't like the floor tile or the patch or repair on the sheetrock uh, was not up to what somebody might call industry standards. And it was, it has been uh, pretty well expressed by uh, properties across the country that they felt that React or the UPCS standard, in some cases HQS, was nitpicky. I can't begin to tell you over 25 years how many times I've heard nitpicky. Uh, the reality is this new inspection protocol, Inspire, is driven specifically on health and safety rationales. So we will touch on it later, but uh, essentially if there is not a corresponding health or safety rationale, then there is not a deficiency associated with it or a standard around it. So that's probably very welcome news to a big part of the industry. Awesome, thank you. All right, so how did we get to where we are right now? Right, so this is a quick overview of the timeline of, of what's transpired over the last few years to get ready to deploy the INSPIRE program. So it was first announced in August, 2019, and shortly thereafter had started publishing draft standards to their website. 
So I've already covered right, HUD, HUD engaged a variety of, um, of stakeholders through various engagement methods to solicit feedback. And that started around June 2020 with a series of virtual workshops. HUD also solicited public comment on the proposed rule that was published in early 2021 and gleaned additional insight through the demonstration inspections that started in September 2021. Most recently, HUD conducted 15 get ready sessions. Those were in-person sessions and they were conducted nationwide. And through each of these methods, HUD gathered valuable insight and understanding of various stakeholder needs. And then they actually took that information and incorporated it into um, subsequent revisions of the standards that were published on the website. Now looking forward, not too far in the future, really, because we are at the end of March already. Um, there are some key upcoming dates that are currently tentative, right? We're still pending that, that final um, rule publication. But some of those key dates include compliance dates and effective dates by program. So it's definitely important to note these as of now we're expecting that the effective date for public housing will be April 1st with a, a subsequent compliance date for public housing of July 1st, 2023. Now for multifamily HCV and CP, the effective date and compliance date are both October 1, 2023. Again, these are tentative dates. And the final INSPIRE rule will clearly identify the pertinent dates by each program. And then INSPIRE inspections will begin once the final rule is published as final and effective. We do expect that HUD will likely issue the final INSPIRE rule very soon with the, some of those subordinate notices that Sam mentioned um, following this spring. So if you joined our webinar with your one and only question being, when do I actually have to do this? <laughs> you wanna look at the green part of this timeline, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Ashla brought up a really important point about effective versus compliance state. So for public housing, when does the rubber actually hit the road? When is HUD going to come out and inspect you using INSPIRE as your standard? Right now, they're saying July 1 REAC inspections would be INSPIRE inspections. So public housing folks in the audience, I think that's the date that you're looking for. For the HCV folks in the audience, your date for when is HUD going to actually do this is October 1. But I'm going to let Ashla give you a little caveat there. Yes, so <laughs> during a recent get ready session, HUD stated that they're considering offering a designated transition period for the HCV program. Again, there's a, this is a very big may offer this. If it is offered, PHAs that opt to participate will be required to amend their administrative plan. And it's important again to note that any potential option for an extended transition period as well as all implementation dates will be clearly conveyed by HUD in the final INSPIRE rule and subordinate notices. So we strongly recommend that you closely monitor HUD's INSPIRE website, um, NMA's PIH alert, and any other industry news sources that you may regularly use to ensure that you're aware of all communications requirements and deadlines. Nashla, we had a couple questions in the chat about the mm -hmm. dates, so I just want to kind of go back to those. So for those folks that asked about, well, what about PBV? PBV is a component of the HCV program, right? And it uses HQS just like HCV does right now. And so the PBV dates would be the same as HCV. So those would be the October date with the potential to maybe have that pushed back. Um, that would be announced in a, in a future notice. So um, for PBV, when you look at notices, just look at whatever it says for HCV, it should be the same, again, because it both, they both use HQS. If you have a PBRA property, like you converted some of your public housing to PBRA under RAD, or you just run a traditional PBRA property, um, that's where it says MF on this um, timeline, multifamily. Multifamily is also an October rollout date. Um, we have not heard anything about that date being pushed back potentially like HCV. So we just, you got to keep your eye out for anything from HUD about that. So PBRA properties, October, HCV, PBV, October, public housing is looking like July 1. Um, and then there was actually a good question in the chat as well that I think Michael can probably address real quick before we move on. Um, and it relates to the rationales, I think, and it says, um, are all deficiencies considered health and safety? Michael, can you just touch on that for a second? Absolutely. And I saw who asked the question. So uh, good morning. Uh, the 
technically, uh, he, I, the gentleman that asked questions is really coming from it from a UPCS or public housing standpoint. And difference between HQS and UPCS is HQS is a pass fail. There are certain things that elevate to a 24 hour deficiency. In public housing, you actually have level one, two, and three. You have specific health and safeties, and then you break down into non-life threatening or life threatening. So in terms of the terminology that people from the public housing or, or UPCS standpoint, it, most items have a life threatening deficiency. And to answer your question, no. Uh, these there are separate deficiencies now. You will have uh, different levels of a standard, you'll have a severe and you'll have a life threatening. They'll be broken out independently, same as it was for UPCS, but not all deficiencies are going to be considered life threatening or severe non life threatening. So I don't know if that answers the question. If not, uh, the person that asked the question has my cell phone. He can call me directly after this meeting. Yeah, so I guess the bottom line is there's not a level one, level two, level three anymore. It's it's a different terminology that they're using. Um, so I think once we go in and, and sort of explain um, how that all works, that'll be a little bit clearer. Okay. All right, so let's get into what I think is kind of one of the most helpful things about this presentation, and that's knowing all right, where were we and where are we going? Let's do a comparison of Inspire to HQS and UPCS. So Michael, I'm gonna turn this over to you. So I'm gonna let you keep the other slide up for a second because I do like to tee this up a little bit. So we've got this great slide. It shows apples and oranges. Uh, there are some distinct differences between Inspire, HQS and UPCS. And literally on a daily basis, I have clients from across the country that are calling and they're very concerned. Change is scary. What is this really going to mean? And on this particular session, we have everybody from executive directors to facilities managers to maintenance personnel, um, and everybody's looking to get something different out of this, this presentation. Uh, first thing I will say is uh, HQS and UPCS are entirely different inspectable formats. So to call them either an apple or an orange, we are really approaching it to a whole new standard. Um, so we can roll to the next. Just wanted to tee that up for a second. So Inspire versus HQS, what is the same? Well, essentially, uh, we're still looking at the same items. We're looking at deficiencies that relate to health and safety, function and operability. Uh, there is not a significant difference when it comes from HQS. We have redefined it. HQS has been criticized for 20 years being too broad, not well-defined. Code of Federal Regulation Chapter 10 is a couple of pages, and yet we have to do all of these assessments based upon this very limited data. So what essentially Inspire did is it took all of the same or similar items that we looked at, and it put more defined parameters around it. So from that standpoint, I, as an inspector, uh, am excited to see some more consistency. Uh, the deficiency should be more defensible. Uh, so for HQS, the format of the inspection is entirely different, but the inspectable items are very similar. Uh, what does not change is it's still pass-fail determination. That has not changed in any way. So if the item is considered to be a health and safety item for the family, then it is still going to be a pass-fail designation. Majority of the inspectable items mostly uh, remain unchanged, so we should have some comfort level in that. Uh, Life-threatening deficiencies still require. So there's no shift from uh, those items that can put the family at risk within an emergency basis. Those life-threatening or 24-hour repairs still are uh, part of the INSPIRE protocol. And does, and this is probably the most important part of this slide, does Inspire impact your program administration? I cannot stress enough, Inspire is only one thing. It's an inspection protocol. It is, it is not intended to tell you how to run your program. It is literally an inspection protocol, no different than HQS or UPCS. So all of our other aspects of your program, you know, your noticing, your abatements, your terminations, uh, how many inspections you do, when you send out the notice, how far in advance you do it. All of those items remain exactly the same. If you're inspecting on a biannual basis, you can continue to inspect on biannual. If you're on an annual basis, continue on an annual. Uh, so people are getting hung up in the idea that Inspire is somehow going to change the program. Inspire is an inspection protocol only. So with that, I've, I've kind of soapboxed that to death. Uh, Inspire versus UPCS, what is the same? Uh, a lot is the same, uh, but I think public housing will be happy with some of the changes. So the scoring is still based upon a 100-point scale. 
Uh, one of the things that, and this was brought up by one of the clients asked this great question several months ago, and it really caused me to stop and think. Uh, even though we're talking about what is the same, this isn't super uh, significant change. In the past, if you had a UPCS inspection, uh, you would get a score. You might score a 70, an 80, a 90, maybe even 100%. In the event you had a couple of minor items in, in uh, the site and you had an issue in the common area or uh, possibly something in the unit, you might choose to create a work order and make the repair. Your score is still what your score was. If you were at a 90 or a 92 and you fix an outlet, you might be at a, at a 90 or an 89. There was no requirement to reinspect unless it was an exigent health and safety. Uh, and at this point in time, that has shifted. At this point, under Inspire, all standards and all deficiencies under those standards do have a associated repair time, 24 hours, 30 days. At this point in time, each property will be required to submit proof that they've made the repair, a work order, a photograph, some form of, of documentation to show that they have in fact mitigated the uh, standard deficiency. That is a significant departure for UPCS. This does not impact HQS because HQS was always a pass fail. Frequency of inspection is still based upon your score. So if you have a FAS score and you're in the 90, um, specifically now that they're rolling this out, you may not see an inspection for three years. If you were in the 70s, then you'll probably see your Inspire inspection next year. So it's still a one, two, three standard that is not shifted. Um, if your properties are in great condition and you're scoring in the 90s, then you may not even see an Inspire inspection for several years. And while the inspectable areas are different, um, we're looking at it different. We're looking at the outside, the inside, and the unit. And prior to that, we had the site, the system, the common area, the unit, the exterior. Had five inspectable items. Now we have three. But we're essentially still looking at all of the same areas. So not a significant change. We're calling it different. It looks a little different on the report. But there's not a significant shift in the inspection protocol. So one of the key takeaways that I've, I've learned over the last couple of years is HUD really felt uh, that they really wanted to put a heightened emphasis on the health and safety of the resident. Uh, UPCS, you know, looks, of course, at the site, the system, the common area, has all of these things that we're looking at. And then they had your criticality, your weighting that all impacted the score. What they basically uh, done in this program is they said, we want to focus. Not We're still going to look at those other items. We're still going to consider them if they're health and safety, but we want to put a greater weighting to the unit. We want to make sure that the families are uh, the area that they spend most of their time, that it's, they're healthy, safe, and, and functional. So um, greater emphasis on the areas most frequented by the residents, and then less emphasis, and this is an area that a lot of public housing uh, managers will like, is less emphasis on areas where less time is spent and condition appearance, uh, less on condition appearance defects. So what does that mean? The industry standard repair, the floor tile that didn't match, the paint color that didn't match, the sheetrock patch that may not uh, match the, the stucco or the pattern. A lot of deficiencies under UPCS were condition and appearance. And we've gone completely away from that. We're really going to be focusing back on what really is going to impact the family. So I think that it really is going to allow properties to focus on the things that matter for health and safety. So non-health and safety items, for all intents and purposes, have gone away under the Inspire protocol. Significant difference, yeah. Um, really focused on object objective deficiency criteria. Uh, they've eliminated the criticality level. They still, of course, will have the weighting. Uh, they have shifted the uh, different inspectable areas, but again, as we talked, we're still covering the same site system, common area, exterior, and unit. We're just placing them in bigger blocks. Um, and something that people in public housing might be uh, very familiar with, the compilation Bolton, that is no longer applicable. All of it's being completely replaced by the new Inspire uh, protocols. So non-industry standard repairs. Uh, in short, how something looks doesn't necessarily correlate to a health and safety cause uh, cause risk to the family. And I covered this, and I do apologize to similar floor tiles as a great example. But some of the other things that are uh, impacting properties, overgrown vegetation. Uh, if you're inspecting in a warm climate and you have beautiful plants around your building, quite often the, the inspector would cite overgrown vegetation if it was touching a fence line. And, you know, was it 
the IV intended to be there for a cosmetic purpose, but that was not well defined in UPCS. And the number of deficiencies cited for overgrown vegetation, uh, quite frankly, we're, we're almost every single property. So we've gone away from all of those, uh, unless of course it, the vegetation is blocking egress, a sidewalk, a tree is overgrown a sidewalk to the point that you can't pass it, but that's something different. That's an egress or possibly a trip hazard, but the optics of the visual growth on the building are no longer a deficiency. Uh, affirmative habitability requirements. Uh, first of all, let me just say that anything that's new to the program uh, from a public housing standpoint uh, may not be scored. It will be recorded, but it will not be scored and held against you for one to three years. There's still, it's kind of a moving target on that, uh, but essentially they're not going to throw something at you new and expect that to be uh, held against you. So if you have a REACT inspection uh, coming up in August and some of these items you were not ready for, those items you'll have a grace period of one to three years. Um, under HQS, it's still a uh, pass fail under HQS. So there's no issue with that. Um, and I, I just kind of want to digress back a little bit. HQS actually had a fairly well-defined, whether it was uh, covered enough or too much, the minimum habitability standards. There was an electrical requirement, illumination requirement. Um, there was a number of things baked into the HQS standard that were not automatically built into the UPCS standard. If under UPCS, if an outlet was there or a light was there, you could certainly inspect to it or a ventilation fan was there, you would inspect for it. But if it wasn't there, it wasn't part of the inspectable protocol. HUD has come back and said there are certain things that are just important for the family to have. And so they have established some lighting, uh, some ventilation, some electrical standards that were are new, not necessarily new inspectable items, but new requirements. And so that's really what we're talking about here with the habitability requirements. So, and the example that was given, at least two working outlets are not present within each habitable room. At least one working outlet or one permanently installed light fixture is not present within each habitable room. This is not new to HQS. This has been part of HQS since its inception, but it is a new minimum electrical and lighting requirement uh, as it relates to UPCS. Now, do I think this is gonna be a big impact? No, most rooms uh, in public housing I've seen either have one outlet and a permanently mounted light or two working outlets. So I don't really anticipate that this is going to have a big impact, but it is specifically part of Inspire Now. Um, Life-threatening deficiencies. So life-threatening is both part of HQS and UPCS, have been since its inception, but there is a significant increase. So um, areas that over the years, 10 years ago, no one ever talked about carbon monoxide. Smoke detectors, of course, were there, but um, carbon monoxide was something that just was not part of our inspection protocol. Of course, it, as the years and tragically the deaths that have occurred, we realized the importance um, of carbon monoxide and the danger of, of unvented gases and fumes. So under INSPIRE, there is a requirement for carbon monoxide detector. There are requirements, expanded requirements for uh, anything to do with carbon monoxide. So any fuel burning appliance that has a vent, whether it be a dryer, a stove, whatever that is, a fireplace, any damage to those vents, any blockage in those vents are now life-threatening deficiencies. And these were deficiencies that were not part of the protocol prior to INSPIRE. So that's why I say there is a significant number of additional 24-hour deficiencies. It should also be noted under UPCS that, or public housing, that if you have a severe deficiency, which is a step lower than life-threatening deficiency, it's still a 24-hour repair uh, for public housing, but it is a 20 or 30-day repair under HQS. Uh, but you know, the criteria is clear and more objective. Um, carbon monoxide and ventilation, probably the most significant area. And smoke detectors, which we do have a slide for, uh, have been expanded and better defined. Um, Michael, there's a question about, is there going to be a grace period for GFCIs and carbon monoxide detectors? So I don't, well, that's, that's since it is habitability, but, and Ashley may be able to speak to this better than I am because she is the expert when it comes to uh, HUD's policy. Uh, I don't think that smoke detectors or carbon monoxide, you know what, I'm, I'm going to defer that to Ashla. 
I know what I want to say. You can but also just Ashley, say, I don't know. That's fine too. No. <laughs> I've been mixed. I've heard mixed signals. So, yeah. Yeah. so I think that um, any sort of uh, potential grace periods or um, a transition period or extended uh, time frame with, before things you know, have to really be locked in, all of that will be detailed in the final in the final um, rule. So I think that translates to they have not quite decided yet, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So sorry, Charles. They we don't have a, an affirmative answer for you quite yet mm -hmm. since this is still up in the air. Um, yeah. Robert asked about missing window guards as well. Window guards, such as uh, you have a window on a 10 story building and there's not a security, uh, if the open window, something to block that. It just says, what about missing window guards? Okay. Yes, um, he says. Yes, okay. So actually, uh, that is a really great question, but the inspection protocol for Inspire does not address window guards. It addresses blocked egress, but it does not address the safety guards on, on multi-story buildings. So it is no longer a part of the inspection protocol. Okay. Um, remove non-health and safety items. And again, this is, I think, should get a standing ovation from, from public housing. Uh, overgrown vegetation, decorative fencing. I mean, how many fence lines on a property have missing pickets and they were cited? Chain link fence that, you know, the kids have crawled through. Um, cosmetic conditions, whether it be, you know, surface cracks, color, mismatched patches, scratches on the countertop, stains in bathtubs, including, and this is one, graffiti, and there was a lot of discussion around graffiti and how is there a health and safety associated with it? Is it a mental um, you know, does it create mental strain or aggravation? Uh, but HUD has finally settled on the fact that they have eliminated graffiti from the uh, Inspire protocol. So uh, the the things that tended to drive down uh, your scores, a lot of the things that did not impact health and safety have been eliminated from the inspection protocol. So that should be a standing ovation. And Ashley, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to, to jump back really quickly to the missing window guard um, question. So while that's not specifically part of the Inspire program as it you know, currently stands today, um, it is not to say that locally as an agency that you yeah. cannot include those. So you absolutely locally as an agency, you can include those types of items in your administrative plan and make them a requirement still locally. Thank you, Ashley. That actually is a great clarification. So this nothing changes in Inspire if you have your building code, uh, your local codes, uh, your administrative plan, all of those things. And we have a slide where I touch on that in a little bit. Uh, but specifically, if your local building code is requiring it, then you can certainly and it may still for your agency may still be a part of your inspection protocol. More stringent requirements. Um, I don't know that this is necessarily more stringent, so let's just talk it through. Under UPCS, uh, there was nothing specifically that said we would inspect for heaters. We would assume that heaters exist in most, if not all, units, but it wasn't specifically called out as a minimum habitability requirement. Well, a heating source now is, uh, and it's always been part of the HQS protocol. UPCS has added it. I don't think that's going to be a significant change. Um, there are heating requirements and you know, obviously your portable heaters are still not acceptable. Uh, there's been more guidance put around the call for aids. Uh, again, under HQS, call for aid would be classified under an other item. It wasn't specifically called out. It is called out in UPCS, but there's more guidance around it. Uh, GFCI, AFCI breakers and outlets, there's additional guidance as well as a requirement uh, near water source. Uh, electrical outlets are now part of the habitability requirement. They've expanded and uh, increased the criteria definitions around mold-like substance. Uh, before it was, you know, kind of all in or all out. Now there is a gradation and you can have a standard versus a severe. Um, so you have ways of being able to address that small issue in a bath uh, bathroom to the larger issue from a roof leak that might be impacting a, a wall or a ceiling. Infestation is much more defined. Uh, structural systems are specifically included in the program now. And where this gets picked up and can be picked up, structural systems, you'll still inspect at the item level, roof, ceiling, floors, and walls. But kind of there's an overarching structural systems, which can include exterior decks and staircases and things of that nature. Smoke alarms uh, have now been 
uh, required to be in each bedroom as well as on each floor and outside of each sleeping area. Carbon monoxide is, is formally part of the program. Uh, fire doors have their own inspection category, and it's very specific and it really details, you know, a small hole. Um, if you have a door and it's fire labeled door, you have a specific category to record. Gas fueled appliances much more expanded and guardrails rather than just being guardrails pass fail or a deficient not there. There's now parameters around the pickets, the stability and things of that nature. So better guidance around guardrails. And I think, do I get to stop talking and pass this on to my illustrious colleague, Andrew? I mean, you can, you can continue if you like. <laughs> it's going to be optional. <laughs> um, so uh, thanks, Mike. We're going to talk briefly uh, about some of the, the Inspire components uh, next, uh, specifically these four areas. Uh, we're going to talk about inspection types, uh, scoring. One uh, note on scoring is a... Um, um, uh, what's where I'm looking for, Mike? Proposed rule. Yeah, the proposed rule. It's, uh, it was a long weekend. A proposed rule is uh, has been issued Friday afternoon. Uh, we have not uh, had a chance to build that into our slides yet. I'll speak briefly to it. I know Sam has gotten through the entire thing. So Sam, if you want to jump in on that part, by all means. Uh, we're gonna. Michael's going to talk through a little bit about the software, and then finally we'll break down an actual inspection standard. So let's just kind of jump right into inspection types. Um, the inspection types have all are basically been rebranded, right? So our, our self-inspection is, you know, our pre-rehack inspection required to do these for all the all the units. The the note and the change here is that HUD is um, requiring these as opposed to suggesting. And the other thing here is that they're not proposed to capturing the results of the scoring of these pre-reacts or self-inspections. Um, they just want us to do them basically, make sure that we're all the all the units are safe and habitable and so forth. Uh, the next type would be the inspection standard. Well, that's very similar to the to the react inspection. Uh, as Michael talked briefly a minute ago, it's uh, still on the one to one to three years cycle, uh, depending on the scoring of your developments. And then finally, the last type would be the inspection, uh, Inspire Inspection Plus, uh, which I don't know what the plus part is, but ultimately we, we really want to try to avoid these if possible. Um, you know, these are obviously done if, um, you know, properties in poor condition, um, there's going to be a higher sample rate to that. And then ultimately, you know, we're there would be trying to provide evidentiary support for enforcement uh, or sanctions to the, to the, to the entity. So um, one, one, just to go back one minute, the um, as far as the inspire inspection, uh, one uh, one kind of little deviation from what we've done with React is the inspection rate goes up slightly. It would be go from twenty eight to thirty two percent. And if you want to get sort of the breakdown of the sample size for units, it is in that proposed rule that came out Friday. Obviously, that's a proposed rule; it's still tentative, but um, it has you know the chart that you're used to seeing for sample size and all that, so you can see um, exactly what's changing there. And it's a nice little comparison because it shows you under UPCS what's your sample size and under Inspire what your sample size would be. And it just like Andrew says, bumps it up a little bit. Um, but if you want to, if you're curious and want to dig into sample size, that is in that proposed rule now. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when we have more than uh, you know forty eight hours to review that notice, and we'll we'll be we'll be able to provide a, a more detailed training uh, on on the on the scoring or at least instructions. So, um, <clears throat> as far as the um, the inspection types of HEV, these are non change. These don't change. Uh, we're still going to do the move in the pre contract inspections, uh, the annuals and biennials based on your admin plan quality control inspections. And I think the one we left out was the uh, the emergency inspection. So, you know, that the, the types don't change in HCV. And I think just to really emphasize that, because Michael said it and Andrew said it, but just so everyone can hear it again, the administration of your HCV program isn't changing, right? It's your inspection standard that's changing from HQS to Inspire, but how you run your program when you do your inspections, that's not changing. So now we're going to talk a little bit about scoring uh, that we, we've got some, a little bit more clarification on than we did last week when we did this. So it's, this is kind of exciting. Um, you know, scoring is still kind of under development, but we've got a pre-publication that's proposed and I'll put the link in the, in the, in the chat. So everyone has access to it. Um, obviously, you know, it's out for public comment. It's going to be, you know, a 30 day period. 
Um, it is not yet published, so there may be some changes to the final rule. But um, you know, I, I said strongly suggest um, you know reading through this, and if you have comments, to uh, to, to give them to provide them. You know, having been a part of the process, I know that um, HUD has been um, you know reads every single one of those comments, right? And we and that goes goes through them uh, with a fine tooth comb and analyzes you know what the potential you know downfall or positive to, to each comment is so um you you want to feel like you definitely have a voice in this because um you know that in in everything that we've done previously uh you know we've taken into account those public comments so uh so as i said scoring still kind of under development even though we kind of have a framework for it now um it's obviously still going to be based on the 100 point scale uh, i think michael mentioned this and stole a little bit of my thunder but um, you know, the one of the big differences here is going to be we are going to have to provide proof that the repair, repair was made uh, within a time frame. So that's obviously a, a big uh, a big change from what we uh, we were doing previously. Um, also, Michael mentioned, you know, our frequency of of inspection is going to be still on the three two one plan. Um, you know, any any inspection that, that occurs, you know, after seven one will be an inspire inspection. Let's say you had your inspection, you know, your uh, react inspections. You know, late 2022 or early 2023, um, you know, you potentially could not see an Inspire inspection for three years in some of your developments. So just a note, um, another kind of key point on the scoring is depending on the severity of the deficiency. Let's So let's say it's a life-threatening deficiency. It will carry a higher weight than a moderate or low uh, rating deficiency. The other thing uh, about scoring that's that's going to be a, a change is that the location of the of the deficiency will also carry more weight. So let's say you have exposed electrical inside the unit um, in the proposed scoring model, you would have it would be a ten point deduction. If it's on the outside, it would be only a five point deduction. So um, that's just as I said, it's kind of all broken down in that rule, but uh, those are the kind of the two main areas of, of scoring that, that are, are about our changes. Um, as we mentioned before, HCV will continue to be a pass fail. So there's no, there's no deviation there. Um, the next slide, and then this, this made the proposed rule as well, is apparently the folks in Congress really liked the health department grades for restaurants and they wanted to, uh, some level of incorporation of that. Um, I'm not sure how this makes it easier or not, but uh, some some people obviously liked it. They didn't make the final rule. Basically, we would just be grading uh, properties based on you know what the score what the scoring is. But the score, like passing the number scores, essentially are unchanged, right? Yes. I mean that you're still getting what what they mean is unchanged. It's just there's a letter now too. Yeah. So if you have a 90, you're still at a you're you're at an A property. If you you know. If you're in a, anything below 60, you go into the D, E, F categories, and that uh, you know that may be helpful, you know, to identify the the really poor uh, performing properties. I just noticed there was an E. Oh. <laughs> so I know it doesn't like make sense, school. right? It's, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't <laughs> well, feel it is, right. It is weird that in school there's no E, right? So I guess <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing. Um, so uh, here's kind of our scoring example. One thing HUD noticed was uh, a lot of units or a lot of developments were passing with a zero unit score. Basically, they have eliminated that option. So if your um, if your units receive a zero score, uh, you you'll be rounded down to a sixty and therefore face obviously the the more frequent inspections. Um, one of the other things that I saw in the notice this morning was that uh, that uh, round there's a round down. So let's say you're at a fifty fifty nine point six. Uh, or you would be rounded down to the to the 50, 59. Um, so that's the, the real key real key point for this scoring. Obviously, we'll have better scoring examples as we incorporate the notice into our future trainings. And Andrew, there's a question in the chat that um, proof of repair that you have to show to HUD. The question is, is that for the annual self public housing inspection or just the Inspire inspection? Mike, I'll defer to you, but I believe it's just the Inspire inspection, correct? You're on You're mute, Mike. Clearly, what I was going to say was not very important. Can you repeat the question, Andrew? Uh, if if the uh, the no, the deficiency correction is is for the self inspection or just the Inspire inspection? Um, so I can't answer that. So at this point in time, if, if they are not proposing, so HUD has taken the position they have always had the ability to ask for 
your pre-react inspection, your self-inspection, that information has always been subject to retrieval by HUD, uh, but they are not proposing that you submit that at this time. There's no discussion around it coming down the pipe. So at this point in time, anything that you do as far as pre-react is internal. You're not required to show proof of repair uh, to HUD at this time, but when you come out and you get your REACT actual audit score, at that point in time, both your life-threatening as well as your standard repairs, you will have to, to make that filing. Awesome, thank you. All right, I think Mike, you're gonna, you're gonna go to the software a little bit? Yeah, because I love software. It's my favorite, favorite you are, topic. You are a guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, really, really big topic. You would think that an inspection protocol, uh, you know, what does really software have to do with an inspection protocol? Well, ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to have a way to record your findings uh, for both public housing as well as the HCV program. So, the software that's developed is going to be an easier transition for public housing. Public housing is familiar with the the React audits that have been through, the DCD public version software that's been available to you, as well as uh, possibly inspection software developed that integrates into your work order system from your software provider. They all, you had your level one, twos, and threes. They had um, decision trees or additional information built into it as you went through it. And essentially the app that uh, HUD developed, and this app is available to the entire industry at no charge, essentially it records very similar to the way your UPCS software functioned. You have your standards and under each standard, so you know, you'll have your deficiencies and then there's a logic path or logic tree. And I know that's technically not the right term. I am not a software developer, so I apologize for, for using a term incorrectly, but for my simple approach, it's a decision tree. You, you go drive down, you make your decision, you move on down, and at the end, you get to your determination. And it will automatically populate, and we'll demonstrate this in just a second how that works. Uh, HQS is a little bit different. If HQS was inspected by room, it was, you had essentially five or six key items, you know, is a room there? Is there electricity? Is there an electrical hazard? You're looking at your floor walls, your ceilings, and then when you went to a kitchen, you would add in a couple more inspectable items. You'd have your sink, your refrigerator, your appliances. In a bathroom, you'd have your toilets, your tubs. Um, they, they look different. It essentially records entirely different. Uh, it, there is nothing similar between an HQS and an Inspire as far as the way the form records, even though you're inspecting all of the same items. The, the Under public housing, it's more, it's more linear. Uh, so I think the transition will be easier for public housing with the app that's currently being used. Um, you may still use the in-house operating system you have. There's no requirement that you, if you've developed your own operating system, if you're using a third-party vendor, but if you're a public housing authority and you choose to use the app, it will be available to you. Uh, I've been told uh, that it will allow you to conduct your internal inspection, not record the results to HUD, but actually export the data uh, out so that you can either put it into an oper your in-house operating system, create work orders, or manage the system however you want. Um, so HQS is a little bit different product line, but, uh, I think that that tool may be of great value to public housing sites if they choose to use it. Next slide. So HUD is very excited about this and I really like the direction it's going. They've basically, they've modernized it. Uh, the old, uh, React audit software was a closed system. Now it's an open system and it's based on the Salesforce platform. So there's just a, a great number of reports and different logic that you can report out on. Uh, it's much more user friendly. You're able to communicate directly with HUD, um, you know, literally seamlessly. Uh, it allows connectivity between HUD and the property ma management on an open platform and it promotes hopefully with the decision tree, uh, if inspectors go and follow it the way it's designed, it should drive you to a consistent result, which should allow for better, more consistent inspections. And they've demonstrated in the get ready sessions that HUD was able to pull real time data. So if you're inspecting and you wanna have a report on what your most frequent fails are, uh, if you want to do some predictive analysis, there's just a number of things uh, 
that this app, when it is available, and it's not, it's still being rolled out and they're still finalizing, but, but when it is available, it will be made available to you. And it should allow you to do uh, predictive analysis and probably significantly for public housing sites, upload certificates um, in advance. And I think the next slide probably covers this a little bit. If it doesn't, I'll keep going. Yeah, okay, so we can just kind of keep talking about software. So in the past, when your React audit would come in, um, they would spend the whole morning going through and sampling, pulling your sample. They would be looking at your certificates. They would be confirming uh, data from within your the number of buildings and any additions, subtractions. The new app will allow you to preload all of that data prior to your React audit, meaning you will have already confirmed your contact information, who will receive the emails, what the contact telephone numbers are. Uh, you'll be able to upload your boiler certificate, your elevator your certificate. You'll be able to confirm, you know, like I say, the number of buildings on the site. So when the React inspector comes out, they'll be able to start immediately on the inspection process. Uh, which is one of the reasons why they're increasing the sampling size a little bit is they feel like the entire launch process is going to be uh, better. The That is great, but I think the thing that our industry is most excited about is the appeals process. The current software or the soft app that's being rolled out is really designed to be that interactive relationship between the public housing site and HUD. So if you get a finding and you don't agree with it, which does happen, uh, in the past, you would have to send in your, your challenge to it, your appeal. Uh, you may or may not hear back. If you did, it may take many months. Um, and HUD recognized that they were not very successful of being able to process all of these appeals. Under the application now, you'll be able to literally hit a button, says appeals, load the photographs that you have, load any documentation you have, and be able to upload that directly to HUD. Um, and I've been told, and I've yet to see, but I've been told that this app will allow you to track where you're at uh, in the process. You know, if it's the day you submitted, the day they've responded back, and at a certain point in time, it will hold HUD to a much higher standard, which we're, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking that's going to really build on the relationship. Uh, the life-threatening uh, report being generated at the end of the day, that hasn't changed. You're, you always We call them exigent reports before. Now it's a life-threatening report. But essentially, at this point, when you receive this report, whether it's a severe or life-threatening, the change is that now you do have to, but you can, upload proof of repair. That's going to be a work order, a photograph, something that mitigates that life-threatening deficiency. And that is built into the current operating app when it's available to you. So some, some tools are available to you. So, and that's why I grabbed this next slide. So this is just a, a screenshot from the app uh, that shows, and I've got my reading glasses on here, but in this particular case, it was inspected on October 20th. It shows the time. You would basically be able to upload your a copy of your work order, maybe a, a photograph of the repair, hit submit, and your filing requirement to HUD on your exigent or life-threatening deficiency has been met. And the 30-day repairs will look very similar to this. So I think we roll into the software itself. So you'll see uh, from a public housing standpoint, uh, you have your inside, in this particular case, we have the inside standard. And remember, we have the exterior standard, the inside standard, and the unit standard. What I do find interesting is the first efficiency we see there is egress. And it has uh, no inside egress. And it has NOD, OD, and NA. Uh, for those from HQS, uh, NOD uh, basically is not part of the terms that we use doing housing quality standards inspection. That stands for no observed efficiency. OD is observed efficiency and NA is not applicable. So in this example, we've opened up the standard where it's alphabetically grouped. We go down and the inspector's concerned about a GFCI outlet. They find the electrical GFCI, AFCI outlet breaker, selects observed efficiency, and it would drive you to the next decision or next slide, uh, which helps bring you down the path to determine whether or not this should or should not be a deficiency. So if you selected electrical GFCI, you only have four things to consider, AFCI breaker, AFCI outlet, GFCI breaker, or GFCI outlet. In this case, the inspector selected GFCI outlet, triggers the GFCI outlet, and it drives you to a final decision, uh, which would be the next screen. 
And the only thing that's available to inspect uh, if you're in this particular deficiency, does the GFCI test or reset button, is it operable? Because if it's not energized, that's under a different deficiency. If the outlet is cracked or broken and there's exposed electrical, then that's under, would be recorded on the uh, exposed electrical conductor. There is a different risk profile to exposed conductor versus a test button. And that's where those rationales come into play. Uh, if we have time and if we're ahead of schedule and we have an opportunity to break into an additional deficiency or two, uh, I can demonstrate that a little bit better. In this case, uh, the corrective time is a 24 hour repair. Uh, and the comment to it is simply does not test. And you have the ability to uh, drop down and put in for room. The inspector has selected garage and that's so it's in an enclosed space, so it's not on the outside, but it's not inside the unit. So they've selected garage. Um, and essentially, at that point in time, you have to take a picture. The, you cannot record a deficiency without being able to take a picture. It will not allow you to move forward. So you're going to take your picture, record deficiency, and that'll bring us, in this particular case, it's showing a simple GFCI out that appears to be on an exterior in a garage area based upon the plastic cover. And it, the location is the building, uh, parking garage. It is corrective time frame is 24 hours. Um, and the additional notes behind AC unit in the garage. So this is what you would eventually, if you were using this for your own pre-react inspection, this is the level of data that you would have. You can see that the inspector has to go through a series of different decisions that brings you to the final result. And that is the whole backbone of trying to find and drive consistency with the inspection protocol. So. All right, before we jump into the standards, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I just wanted to address. Um, one of the questions was about, um, does this apply in the tax credit and home programs? So the idea with the Inspire in Inspection Standard, right, is that UPCS and HQS are sunsetting. So all inspection standards, right, or all programs that either use UPCS or HQS are, are having those go away and being replaced by Inspire. However, there's a little caveat for the tax credit program, right? And that is that in the tax credit program, um, first of all, the program is run by the IRS, not by HUD, right? So HUD um, doesn't directly impose inspection standards on the tax credit program. In the tax credit program, what the rules say is um, each state housing finance agency or allocating agency um, gets to decide in their QAP um, what the inspection standard is for, for their folks, right? And almost all of them, I think all of them, use UPCS, right? You could use local inspection standards. Everybody does UPCS, right? So if UPCS is sunsetting and going away, that makes sense that at some point, Inspire will replace UPCS. What I cannot tell you is a date. Like that timeline didn't say anything about tax credit. The reason for that, again, is because HUD does not run the tax credit program. It's an IRS program. And so the IRS has to come in and say, okay, as of this date, this is when, you know, if you're using UPCS, this will apply. And then that'll trickle down to HFAs who will need to start using that as the inspection standard, put that into their compliance manuals if they have one, et cetera. And so um, really in the tax credit world, what we're waiting on is for the IRS to address this. Um, that I'm aware of, the IRS has not said a word about Inspire. And I will say that as an industry, um, the tax credit industry really has not been talking about Inspire at all. Um, we're going to be, Nan McKay will be at NCSHA this year. If you go to that conference, it's the big tax credit conference. We're gonna talk a little bit about Inspire um, there, but I think the tax credit industry is a little bit behind in realizing, realizing this is coming down. Um, the question also asked about the HOME program. HOME is a HUD program. It's operated by CPD and the rollout would be in um, October like multifamily and HCV. Um, and then there was a question about, is Nan McKay going to do classes that are more specific to HCV or to public housing? Yes, we're going to roll out a public housing uh, version of the Inspire class. And then later in the year, we're going to roll out um, an HCV version of the class. So yes, there will be training that is more specifically tailored to public housing and HCV later in the year. We just have to wait for HUD to finalize everything, right? And I think that was it. So Michael, go ahead and... Oh, actually, there's a question for you, Michael. Are HUD inspectors taking pictures? Uh, they will be. 
uh, so all the, the way the program and the app is developed is you really cannot record a, uh, a deficiency without attaching a photograph. So the, yes, they will be taking pictures. Um, and then this question we got last time, but I think it's a great question. And I know we don't have a solid answer for it, but um, it's an HCV question. Does Inspire impact the amount of time it takes to conduct an inspection? Does it add more time or less time for the inspector? And I know we don't have a solid answer, but I think Michael and, and Ashley, you both kind of weighed in on this last time and, and I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Well, and yes, and I, I have very strong opinions on that. Um, the, I don't know that they're correct, but I do have opinions. The, I think, the operative is two things that affect uh, an inspection. One is the amount of time that it takes to navigate the inspection software. Uh, currently, the way the app is set up, there is a, a you're required to mark NOD on each standard as you go through it. Um, I expect that that will be streamlined as time goes forward. The other uh, aspect is the inspection itself. Uh, really for public housing should not take significantly longer. Learning how to navigate, learning, I think, learning these standards and the training associated with knowing how this inspection program comes together is going to be critical for efficiency. If you're doing the hunt and peck and you're you're going down one logic path and a rabbit hole, you realize you went down the wrong area, you need to back up and go to exposed conductor versus GFCI outlet, that can cost a lot of time in, in the field. The actual inspection itself, going to the to the site, walking the site, walking the common areas, and I'm talking for public housing, um, and walking through the unit, quite frankly, shouldn't take any longer than the current inspection. The amount of time that it takes to record is still determined. I think the learning curve, once everyone becomes comfortable with the software and, and with the inspection program, um, for public housing, it should not be significantly different. HQS half your time is driving to the house the other half of your time is doing the inspection uh there is a huge big question mark right now the, the hqs standards you're very focused you're looking primarily at the pathway from where you park to the unit conduct the inspection there's not a lot of guidance around the uh common areas and things of that nature hud is still weighing in and uh department of uh housing choice voucher has some thoughts on this we don't have final determination but it's expected that we will get some guidance that will give us the scope of the inspection for hcv in other words right now you've built an entire standard which has 160 deficiencies our standards and sorry 63 standards 180 or 160 deficiencies and you have 35 on the exterior you have certain ones that are allocated to the inside the inside area may be streamlined for hqs or housing choice voucher so we'll know more as as they weigh in on the actual areas that we're going to need to look at ashley did you want to add anything to that sure just um you know, at a recent get ready session um i did here, um, someone from the kind of that was there as a participant or an attendee for the get ready session, they did provide some anecdotal um, commentary on the time that it's taking their um, their own inspectors to work on the HCV program at their agency. Um, now, of course, during that initial ramp up period where you're getting familiar with the structure of the standards, you're getting familiar with whether it be um, you know your own in house or a third party vendor um, inspection software that you're using or HUD's new software that you're using. Um, it's going to take some time to get used to it. So I think it can reasonably be expected that it will take a little bit longer to begin with. Um, but that anecdotal comment was that uh, it was actually a faster inspection for their inspectors than um, what it was under HQS. So um, again, that ramp up period, but I agree with Michael that it will likely end up kind of evening out and either kind of taking the same amount of time or, or potentially less. It's really going back to that, the software, um, getting familiar with the software. The structure and then um you know how what that looks like when it's deployed in the in the field so ashla that comment was from someone uh, operating an hcv program and Correct. margaret in the chat essentially said the exact same thing for public mm -hmm. housing they're part of the demonstration right. and she said at first it was taking a little bit longer for the inspectors because mm -hmm. they were learning the software but by the time they got their last inspection they were moving really quickly and they weren't taking nearly as long so it That's sounds great. like we have thank you margaret anecdotal evidence for both programs mm -hmm. So we're going to jump in. Yes. So 
I know, at least for some people, the most important part of this is actually the inspection protocol. We spent all the last hour talking about why, what, some, how the software. So we're going to take some time now and actually talk about the, you know, what is Inspire and what does it look like from a standards and deficiencies. So under the Inspire program, you have 63 inspection standards and a possible 180 possible deficiencies. So under each standard, you could potentially have multiple deficiencies. It can be from one deficiency up to, I think the highest is either 10 or 11. The part of that, and we, if we get an opportunity later, I'd, I'd really love to dive into it, is again, every deficiency has to have a corresponding rationale. And one of the examples I give is a door that does not open is a egress concern. The family can knock it out. A door that does not close is a security concern. So it has two different risk profiles, two different rationales, and make up, you know, two of the deficiencies, even though it's still talking about a door, uh, the entrance door, exit door. Um, you can, there's two specific deficiencies around it opening and closing because they have two entirely different risks. So I find that fascinating. So if we roll into this a little bit, uh, in HCV, determination is the inspectable categories of the area for common areas still being defined. We, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit on the slides. I do apologize. Um, I am expecting that there will be a streamlined uh, inspection area. At least that's what I've been told. Uh, we may not need to walk every mechanical room, every closet, every uh, common space in the building, uh, but it has not been officially uh, determined and we're waiting for guidance on that. So I just want to put that out. I think the biggest concern for HCV, if you're an uh, HCV inspector, is you're used to walking to the unit, inspecting the unit, and then going to your next unit. You have multiple in the same building, you go to 102 and then go up to 305, you conduct your unit inspection and you keep rolling. You do look at the exterior, you're looking at trip hazards, you're looking at you know any other concerns, but it's really unit-based. Uh, this program incorporates you uh, just for UPCS you did have site system common area uh, unit it incorporates a full scope inspection which is really designed more as an audit inspection for react so I think we're going to find some common ground when it comes to uh, the public space the inside area I think will be uh, redefined for us for the HCV side of the program so I think that's a super important point, Michael, that if you look at the standards as they currently stand on the website and you're running an HCV program and you think, oh my gosh, right. a lot of this does not apply, you're right. And HUD knows that and they're thinking about it, right? Is and the they takeaway. are. And, uh, you know, HUD is, from all the conversations I've had, HUD is very aware of the challenges and they're really uh, very open and want this to be a very successful rollout and be reasonable, not be an undue burden. So... You know, I think all the parties that are involved are really mission driven to make this successful. Um, PHAs are not precluded from achieving their local goals or meeting local standards by adopting a more stringent requirement. So this was one that it uh, became kind of an important thing for me. Uh, I spend more time working with the HCV programs. I, of course, do uh, public housing as well, but HCV has been a uh, backbone of my 25-year career. Uh, and one of the things that we all get accustomed to is bedrooms, you know, have bedroom requirements. We have electrical outlets. We have lighting requirements. Um, we have one of the, the main biggies that has to have a window. And there have been properties over the years where, you know, it might be an old Victorian where the person's taking an, uh, a large walk-in closet and trying to call it a, a bedroom. And for purposes of the HAP contract and the rent that's approved, you know, we want to make sure that the families are, are getting what they're paying for. So what when they developed this, they eliminated a number of those requirements. So currently under Inspire, there is no room requirements with respect to and I'll say square footage, ceiling height, it's not spelled out. There's no window or ventilation requirement in a bedroom. This is a, a shift from what we're accustomed to in HCV. Uh, there are things such as the, the, you know, we used to talk about the hole in the wall being eight and a half by 11, always seemed like a gigantic hole. We've tightened those uh, standards, or those standards have been tightened up. But as it relates to, um, you know, what your agency wants to see whether it be a landscaping requirement, a room bedroom requirement, a square footage requirement, a window requirement, all of that is still 
your choice. It's your program. It's your community. You can incorporate local standards, your particular goals and missions. So I would say as, as it has always been, and I've seen this applied differently across the country, uh, if you feel like the standard is not well-defined for you, you as an agency have the ability to amend your administrative plan and really bring what you're trying to accomplish to the inspection protocol. It, it Inspire is a baseline. You can always customize and add to it to improve your, your mission statement as an agency. Um, so we're going to go into a standard now, uh, just to kind of show you how the standard breaks down. And I believe that Samantha is going to actually log into the HUD website for this. I was going to. It's not working, of course, because we're live. Hold on. Let's try one of more. Of course. Time. There we go. What's thinking? Do, do, do. There we go. So where Samantha's going with this is... Um, it is the HUD website. Anyone that's on this call, anyone in the country can log in and see this exact same information. You can go in and just start opening standards and reading down through them and to kind of get a feel of what that looks like. Um, but this will give us an opportunity to show you what it, how it opens up in the decision. Again, not a decision tree, but logic path, the, those, uh, how it makes sense to me at least. And what, let's see, we're doing, which standard are we doing? Uh, sharp was, edges. Sharp edges. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. And there was a reason that sharp edges, uh, while this is getting opened up, was selected. HUD was really concerned that React auditors uh, and inspectors across the country were over inspecting. Uh, that was a big push. And that's why they focused back on the unit. They recognized that some of the inspections that were conducted were being now, some of the standards were being over-inspected, trip hazards being one, um, cut hazards being another. Uh, at what point in time is a sharp edge wow. a health and safety? I apologize, uh, Michael. I didn't share my screen correctly earlier. I did the PowerPoint presentation. Hold on just a second. There we go. Can okay. everyone see the standard now? Yeah, so are we live or is this a, a slide? Yeah, this is, this is live. Okay. Sorry about so, that. Let me actually hold on just so you guys can see the website because I, I shared the yes. wrong screen. This is the Inspire Standards page that Michael was talking about. And then here are all the standards listed. Um, so just, then, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead, Sam. Oh, and then I would just went down to sharp objects or sharp edges, I'm sorry, and clicked on that. So, but you can see it's basically alphabetical. Uh, you can drill down to whatever it is. This particular standard is 2.2. Uh, can you go back to that? Mm -hmm. Sam, so one of the other items, if you can go back up to the very top, you see these these categories. So right there. So you'll see to the right hand side, you've got unit inside and outside. This website uh, shows you clearly that the out, uh, address and signage is only inspectable outside. The bathtub and shower is only inspectable inside and unit. So that hot tub that you have in your backyard is not an inspectable item. So this is, you know, just if you're navigating the system, if you want to go in and take a look at things, the uh, the Y, yes, for inspectable, shows you areas that that standard is applicable. And as an example, uh, out of all of the standards, only 35 are applicable to the outside of the unit. And so you don't have, you know, all of the deficiencies and all the standards don't all apply to each area. So we're going to go down to sharp edges because HUD specifically uh, thought this was an area um, that had been being oversighted and they wanted to provide additional clarification. So it literally starts out, you've got sharp edges. The version is uh, version 2.2, uh, last updated 623 of 22, and it goes right into a definition. The physical hazard within the built environment, i.e. human-made structure, uh, that can lacerate or puncture the skin. That is what we're looking for here. We're not talking about anything other than something that can lacerate or puncture the skin. Uh, this inspectable item, it's a purpose. There's no purpose uh, to sharp edges. Uh, common components, there's no common components. It can be anything. Your location is both the unit, the inside and outside, and there's no additional uh, information required. Now, I want to take just one second and say more information. This is not a placeholder. More information for Inspire is extremely valuable. Um, if you're looking at GFCI outlets and your or AFCI outlets and the requirement. Under more information, it says 
Do you have to have an outlet within six feet of the, of the water source, GFCI protected? However, if it's supplying energy to a major appliance, which could be a refrigerator, an outlet, a garbage disposal, a dishwasher, washing machine, it is not subject to this requirement. You wouldn't know that unless you read the more information. So you really do have to take a look at the entire picture for each and every standard. Uh, so we're moving on. Uh, deficiency sharp edge, you have one deficiency. In some cases, you can have 10 deficiencies, but in this particular case, it's one deficiency. Sharp edge that can result in a cut puncture hazard is present. That's the deficiency. And so if we go down further, it talks about deficiency criteria. And the, the sharp edge that can result in a cut puncture hazard is present. The sharp edge that can result in a cut puncture hazard is likely to require, and this is key, emergency care stitches uh, present within the built environment, human-made structure features and facilities. So what the HUD was trying to do is something that might scratch, you know, a little bit of lifting linoleum, a crack. We're, we're talking about something that is sufficient enough that it would either lacerate or puncture, most likely resulting in emergency care and stitches. So if you're talking about something that's relatively minor, and you may have called it a cut edge or a sharp edge in, in prior inspections. HUD's being very specific. The criteria is that it can lacerate, puncture, requiring emergency visit, and potentially stitches. So they've really elevated that bar. So the correction time frame, this would be a severe non-life threatening. And so uh, under the rules of the program, severe non-life threatening for public housing is a 24-hour repair. For HCV, it's a fail, uh, and it is a 30-day repair. So what we've done is we've walked through, you know, where it is, what it is, what the criteria is, and so for every deficiency, you really need to understand what the criteria is. That's a, that's that health and safety risk that's driving. It goes back to those rationales, um, and then it clearly shows that it is a the repair correction times for public housing versus HCV. And I think that's maybe an important one to point out when it says correction time frame here, it means for everybody except HCV, right? Well, it, it depends on what inspection protocol you're currently using. So your multifamily and public housing, I believe, fall under this, or uh, but your PBV would fall mm -hmm. under HCV. Yes. Yeah. So HCV and PBV are here. And then when it says correction time frame, if you're public housing or multifamily, you're looking there. Correct. Um, and then it goes down, you know, you're, you're going to, it's basically giving you guidance. So that every single standard, every single deficiency has this level of detail. So it says, what's your inspection process? You know, if it's not self-explanatory above that, there's additional guidance being provided. So in this case, they look through the unit to identify sharp edges that can result in a cut or puncture hazard. If present, determine if the sharp edge is likely to require emergency care if the resident comes in contact with it. And the examples of sharp edge for the unit, not limited to broken glass, damaged tiles uh, with an exposed edge. So every standard and every deficiency has an inspection process that's uh, laid out for you. It, it tells the inspector exactly what to do. So in theory, if you've never done an inspection, you should be able to pick up this, this book of information. And if you follow it step by step, you should re, uh, get to the same point uh, within the inspection process, which is intended to drive consistency across programs, platforms, and inspections. And then Ashla, did you want to say a word? Yes. Yeah, so um, not only will it outline that information, you know, just for the deficiency itself, but it's, it's tailored by each inspectable area. And so that deficiency criteria, right, while the deficiency title itself, so a sharp edge that can result in a cut or puncture hazard is present, that deficiency title is the same for the unit, the inside and the outside, but the deficiency criteria, the subsequent health and safety determination, as well as the inspection process and rationales may vary by area. Yeah, and so this one is not a great example of that, I think, because they're all the same, but that is a really good point that you can't like say, oh, sharp edge, I read unit, I'm done, right? Mm -hmm. For this, there's unit, and then it goes on to inside, and then Correct. it goes on to outside. And these happen to be the same, but you're right, and a lot of them, they are not the same, and so it's important to look at all. Um, well, and like, if we look at, take a look at the um, inside location for this deficiency, if we go to the inspection process observation, some of the example or the, the sample areas where the inspector should be looking, um, are different. So we've got hallways, shared living spaces, and shared facilities, which is a little bit different than what we saw at the unit. Um, 
same idea at the outside location. So the deficiency criteria um, while it remains most of the same, right? The observation, again, we're providing examples of sidewalks, walkways, playgrounds, courtyards. Also that more information here that Michael mentioned earlier as being very, often providing very crucial information. Um, the same holds true when we get down to the inspection process. So in this case, um, to answer, I think it was Andy posed a question in the chat around asking if a piece of glass near a dumpster would be considered a sharp edge. So there is actually the more information, a specific example of broken glass um, being a, a sharp edge. And I think, Ashla, thank you. That is uh, does clarify it a lot. And one of the this standard, it the is fairly consistent. The inspectable areas and the guidance may shift, but it's not doesn't demonstrate that piece. But I think an example would be if you have a, a two bedroom, one bath unit, the toilet is non operational. That has a certain impact on the family. Uh, that is going to have a different weight. It's going to have a different repair time. But if you go to a common area bathroom in the same building um, and it's non-operational, but the, the resident has use of the facility in their unit, uh, it's going to have a different correction time. It's going to have a different uh, severity. So there are the impact on the family. It can be different uh, just as it can be different if you have a one or two bedroom, one bath unit and the facility is non-operational may be different than if you have a four bedroom house with two bathrooms and one of the bathroom facilities are non-operational, that has a different path to go down. So these are just keys and, and they tie back to the direct impact and the, and the rationales. And David had a question in the chat, is the inside portion just common areas? Anything under a roof line, uh, well, if it's on, I can't say roof line because you can have port shares, you can have exterior walkways. Um, but essentially, that's are you, is the question regarding mechanical rooms or? It's, it's meaning like there's unit inside, outside. What is inside? Inside is essentially the common area. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we uh, have about 30 minutes left. I want to go to our um, summary and our Q&As, and then if we have some more time, um, we can maybe hop back and look at another standard. Um, anything else anyone on the panel wants to say about the, the standards before we do that? Nope. Okay. All right. So key, some key takeaways from this. Ashley, are you doing this one? Sure. Um, so some key things to keep in mind, and we've covered quite a bit here. Um, so essentially all, all components of the INSPIRE program are still under development. So everything that we covered today is based on what we know as of today. Uh, that final proposed rule and the subordinate notices will provide the INSPIRE framework and will, will serve as your guide for all program requirements and key implementation dates. I stated earlier, it's very important that you mo closely monitor HUD's Inspire website, NMA's PIH alert, and any other industry news sources for the latest program communications and requirements. Um, as you mentioned earlier, as well, we've been proactively monitoring Inspire since its conception. And so we, our industry experts are actively working to um, develop and, and revise our training um, training seminars and our materials that we'll be ready to guide you through the implementation of these sweeping changes. We'll host additional help sessions to communicate any new developments. And then again, we'll also offer those comprehensive uh, training seminars that will cover the INSPIRE program for each, um, each program. And those will include certification options as well. And that will all be following publication of the final proposed rule. Yeah, and I just want to jump in here for a second, since this is what I do at Dan McKay. Um, so uh, Ashla mentioned our PIH <coughs> alert. So all the time people ask our trainers and consultants, oh my gosh, how do you guys know so much? How do you stay on top of all of this? Um, it's because of our PIH alert. So I'm going to do a quick commercial for it. If you don't get it already, um, we have folks at Dan McKay that monitor I don't even know if it's like 30 different websites or something like that um, for the latest information from for HUD programs for multi uh, for public housing and HCV. And then we send a daily email alert that tells you what's new. So on Friday, you would have gotten an email that says, hey, there's a new proposed rule. 
um, from HUD on Inspire scoring. And then there's an analysis of that piece of information. We also put out a monthly newsletter that has what were the like top five news stories of the month, just in case you missed some of your daily emails and also has a frequently asked question. So it's a really, really great resource, um, especially in 2023, where not only do you have to keep on top of Inspire, but we also got Hotma that you need to keep on top of as well, as well as a bunch of changes in fair housing regulations. So I'm going to put in the chat if you're interested in the PIH alert, if you don't get it already, um, you can email sales at namik.com or you can buy it off of Namik's website. And then as Ashla said, we are diligently working on making classes right now. We are going to launch our public housing class first um, since um, Inspire will be effective for public housing before it will be for HCV. So we're in the process of writing that class right now. Our goal is to debut it this summer again, pending publication of all these notices, because we can't give you a class if we don't have final information from HUD. But our goal is for the public housing class to come out this summer, and then our HCV class to come out this fall. So there will be deep dives into those standards that we just did very shortly. All right, and with that, we are going to get into um, our Q&A session, there's a question in the chat about, is there a published listing of items that will be inspected? Russell, that is the um, website that we just went to. So that Inspire website has all the, the standards on it. So if you go look at the, the website, now those standards are not final. They're the current version of the standards. Um, they will be um, probably uh, changed before the final release, um, but you can get a good idea of what the standards are by going onto that Inspire website we just looked at. Um, okay, with that, we're going to jump into the Q&A session. So the first question, which was also in the chat, and we're going to answer that now, is, is there a new inspection booklet? Is there, will there be a standard form or checklist similar to the form HUD 52580A for inspection? And Michael's going to take that one. Uh, no, thank you, Sam. So one of the things uh, within the Housing Choice Voucher Program, HQS, some people called it a checklist. Some people call it a booklet. Uh, so essentially, the inspection starts out life as a checklist inspection. Uh, you can have long form, short form, and that's where HQS started. And then it eventually rolled into mobile applications uh, over the years. HUD did not build the mobile application. Uh, they have built an app. So the term booklet means to, you know, to the HCV and HQS inspectors, that, that's a HUD form 52580A or checklist. Uh, HUD has suggested, and I've had conversations with them, that they will be developing a form that will be published. That being said, um, I'm not sure what or when that's, uh, how, what that's going to look like and how it would really work. So if you take a look at the fact that you have 63 standards and you have 180 deficiencies and the entire program is driven based upon rationales and decision trees to, to get you to the end result, it, that would be incredibly difficult to put into a form that could be practically used on a daily basis in the field. You almost need technology to get there. That being said, if you're an experienced inspector, um, essentially you're going to learn all of those uh, inspectable items, those standards, those deficiencies. You will know them. They will be part of your daily life. Um, and you could probably go out with a yellow tablet, do an inspection, make the appropriate notes, be able to go back to an office and accurately and correctly record it if you have committed to the training and knowledge base to get there. Um, so yes, HUD is suggesting that they will produce this form. Just from a professional standpoint, being an inspector for many, many years, um, I am somewhat challenged to see what that form is actually going to look like from a practical matter to be used the way we currently use the 52580. All right, question two, where should the carbon monoxide detectors be located in units and basements? What is considered vicinity of sleeping areas? Also, if there's no fuel burning source in the unit or building, all electric, one is not required, right? That is correct. So I'm assuming this is mine as well, Sam. Mm -hmm. um, so great question. Uh, there's a lot of questions around smoke detectors and carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is essentially new to both HQ or HCV as well as public housing. It became finalized in December 27th, I think, of 2022. So it is part of what we're doing. Um, and it's been much more defined within the Inspire protocols. Uh, we did, because it's such a good question, we pulled up a slide which we can talk about. Do you want to go to the next slide? 
So, but to answer your question, if you do not have a uh, fuel burning appliance, uh, no gas heater stove, and you do not have an attached garage, then you are not subject to the CO uh, requirement. The carbon monoxide alarms are not required if you do not have a fuel burning appliance or attached to a garage. So that's kind of answers that high level. If you do have fuel burning appliance, um, there is a difference. When some of the agencies I work with essentially adopted when it came time to carbon monoxide, they adopted, oh, we're just going to match under HQS, we're going to match the smoke detector. There was an area to record it. Uh, it was easy to just to match it. If it was a 24-hour fail, they incorporated it. It was just a simple, clean way to align their ins current inspection protocols to the carbon monoxide requirement that became effective in December. When Inspire rolls out, there is an and or. So the smoke detector requirements for Inspire will require one per level, that includes basements, one per bedroom. It is now going to be a requirement that you have a smoke detector in the bedroom and you have to have a smoke detector in the hall or the access area in the vicinity of the bedroom. So if you take a look at uh, the second slide that just shows a general floor plan, you've got a bedroom on one side of the apartment, you've got a bedroom on the other side of the apartment, you have a dining room, living room separating the two. You would require a smoke detector in bedroom one and in the hall near bedroom one, a smoke detector in bedroom two and near in the hall near bedroom two because there's a separation between the two bedrooms and only one CO detector in protecting the bedroom uh, one and two. So you would have four smoke detectors required and only two CO detectors. So, you know, there are some real rabbit holes you can go down to on this. If you have a gas fired uh, furnace, uh, and you have a register, you can put the CO detector by the first register feeding the unit would meet the location requirement. Uh, but you're getting into real nuanced aspects. We don't have enough time to today to go through. Um, and there's questions, can you use the combination? And absolutely, if you choose to use the smoke detector, CO detector combinations, those are absolutely acceptable. There's additional guidance that may be coming downstream with respect to 10-year battery lives, but that's part of something that will be, and I know, Ashley, you're probably more on top of those regulatory issues than I am, uh, but they, they have given us enough information to know that smoke detectors are now going to be required in bedrooms where that was optional under HCV uh, before. CO uh, alarms are required, um, and these graphics, I think, relatively answer the question. And then, Michael, there's a, a good point in the chat. Carolyn said that in the state of Washington, CO detectors are required regardless of heat source. So can you speak to if your state law requirements are different? And that follows the same as it always has. If it's, I mean, we're a federally funded program, but it's universally understood that we follow local guidance. So if that's a state law, then um, essentially, then I, I would say that it would apply to your inspection or your agency in Washington. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sean asks, will older construction be grandfathered in in public housing? No, uh, there is. And again, Ashley, I'm going to rely on you um, the because I don't recall whether or not the CO alarm location and smoke detector is considered new and they have a grace period. But, uh, but as far as it being grandfathered, uh, grandfathering does not exist. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, related question is HUD requiring smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors in all sleeping areas. So instead of individual devices, we should urge the owners to install combo units. Is HUD planning to provide the financial means to replace existing devices? So uh, another great question. I think I kind of answered it. So no, they are not requiring carbon monoxide alarms in each bedroom. It's an and or. So there is a, a separation between the requirements around smoke detectors and or smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms. There is some difference. Uh, you are not precluded from having the, the combination. Um, in the state of Washington, it sounds like that is probably desirable given the fact that that's a requirement. Um, is HUD planning on providing financial uh, uh, means to replace existing devices? I know that HUD, I, and we've talked to HUD about this, and their guidance is speak to your local regional field office. They're, they are looking at, at a very high level, uh, how to partner with the industry to not be a financial burden across the board, but I don't think there's any specific 
decisions around smoke detectors or any specific item at this point in time. So uh, HUD has not taken a stance on it. I know that there's being looked at and there may or may not be funds available through your local uh, field office. I would encourage you to check with them. And do the CO detectors have to be hardwired? They do not, absolutely not. Okay. I have um, a comment here as well, Sam. So we were made aware again during another a, a recent get ready um, session that within two years, um, HUD will be implementing the NFPA 72 fire yeah. safety requirements. So what that means for, for us in, in, in our rules is that any fire alarms that do not have sealed 10 year batteries will need to be replaced. So if you are you know, a property manager or an agency, right, and you're going to be replacing um, your fire, your smoke alarms to comply with the new INSPIRE standards, we recommend that you go ahead and do that sealed 10 year battery type device so that you don't have to go through the whole exercise again in a couple of years to comply with that NFPA standard. Okay, and then one more CO question, and then I think we'll we'll move on so we make sure we cover everything. Um, as I understand it, smoke detectors are supposed to be located near the ceiling and CO detectors near the floor. Where would a combo smoke detector CO be located? Uh, so it, it is universally understood that carbon monoxide is heavier than air and will, will sink. Um, smoke or heated air will rise, and it is generally accepted that the proper location for a carbon monoxide alarm should be you know to the lower side you know below a person's uh breathing area and smoke detectors should be above it so when you stand up you don't put your head into smoke that being said and that's technically a true statement um that is not part of inspire and it's not part of, of proposed uh, national fire protection uh they are accepting your combo unit so even though it kind of flies in the face of what uh inspectors and industry people talk about carbon monoxide and how it impacts, um, it is acceptable to have the combination devices. So okay. I respect the question, but. Okay. Uh, next question. Our question is regarding our HQS inspector for our HCV program. He is HQS certified. Will he need to be certified for Inspire? I think. So Andrew, I think was gonna actually. Yeah, I think so. I'm, sorry. I'm dealing with a little bit of a connection issue. Um, so we have uh, currently there's no requirement for uh, certification. Uh, we kind of heard whispers that they there may be a possible requirement for uh, for Inspire uh, inspectors to be certified. Um, no decisions been made, or we haven't been aware of uh, as of, as of yet. Obviously, I think you know Sam and, and Mike mentioned earlier. You know we're going to have the certification courses ready uh, rolled out by the latest, uh, you know, hopefully October for HQS, um, you know, this year. So, um, you know, if that does become a, uh, a requirement, you know, we'll be able to meet that need. And even though it's not a requirement, obviously your folks are going to need to be certified just so that they know what they're doing when they go out and inspect. So while it's not a requirement today that you get HQS certified, people go get certified right. because they need to know what you're doing. Right. Yeah. That, and that was where I was going to jump in, uh, Sam, Andrew, is Right now, HUD, there is no specific certification requirement to be an HQS inspector. The guidance is simply that the agency must ensure that the inspections are completed following those guidelines. And that's the same uh, with Inspire. That being said, I think it would be an injustice, whether you call it a certification or a training, um, being able to know how to navigate Inspire is significantly more involved than uh, housing quality standards, even if you're inspecting the same items, how you record it, where you find it, where that information is at. So I encourage uh, continued training for any HQS inspectors. Knowing how to do an HQS inspection by itself um, is not sufficient. Yes, a good inspector can always get an inspection done, but uh, the structures are so significantly different. I think that training has great value regardless of where you get it. Okay. Um, question five, and that maybe we'll need a little background on this question, but how will residents submit the units that they want inspected? Will these be in addition to the total unit count or above and beyond? So as of now, there's not been a decision made one way or another if um, residents will be able to submit units uh, that they would like to have um, inspected. However, it's been stated that if HUD goes this route that resident um, selected units may be supplemental to the inspection sample itself. Um, Andrew and I know Sam both talked on earlier the proposed scoring notice that was just issued on Friday. So the INSPIRE sampling plan is outlined in that notice. 
So I recommend that you review that in detail, provide any public comment uh, that you may have within that required time frame. Tim, anything you'd like to add here, Sam? Uh, question six, what are the major differences between INSPIRE and HQS as it pertains to the HCV program? And what if what changes in operations like tools, forms, training will HUD be responsible for supplying and what changes will each PHA be responsible for? So I think, Michael, you're going to take this at kind of a high level. Yeah, because we've actually kind of touched on this, uh, but just to kind of reiterate, um, major differences between INSPIRE and HQS as it pertains to the HCV program, very simple, there is none. The INSPIRE, as I've said earlier, is an inspection protocol. Your administrative program and how you run your program is still unchanged. There is no program changes driven by INSPIRE as it relates to HCB. So I want to be super clear on that. Um, what changes in operation, including tools, forms, and training? Um, there's probably significant changes. Uh, it's an entirely different inspection protocol. So that although HUD is a, uh, providing an application free of charge uh, that will allow you to record the results, working out some of the details of how that communicates with your existing operating system, if you're a manual, uh, if you have your own software or you have a third party provider, uh, how that's going to implement and roll out over the next six months is yet to be determined. Um, but the same was true when, when HQS was rolled out. Uh, HUD did not provide an operating system for mobile field inspections. They came out with the rules uh, of the road. They said, this is what your inspection needs to, to do. And individual agencies, third party uh, vendors, um, created working tools for their partner agencies to be able to conduct and record and manage their program. And I suspect that the same will be true in this case. As far as the tools, um, HUD is providing, again, uh, free access to the app if you choose to use it. Uh, they suggest that they're going to have YouTube training videos for each one of the standards. Uh, be curious to see that you know when it actually rolls out. Uh, so that's their form of training, as well as the published standards that we've uh, shown with that website is at today. The other tools, which might include your electrical testers, your heat guns, um, you know, possibly moisture testing, uh, those devices are at the agency level. HUD is not proposing that they're going to provide any of those tools at this time. So I don't know if that answers the question or not. Andrew, you have anything to add? You're muted, Andrew. No, I was uh, I was looking at the next question. Um, okay. Um, could you provide some suggestions for software programs on the market that will suffice for the new Inspire regs for inspections conducted with handheld devices? Yeah. So, um, you know, I was at uh, conference last week in DC and was able to get a hold of two of the major software providers. Um, you know, everybody in the industry is ready for this, right? They know it's coming, and then they know that you know they're reliant that you know, their clients are relying on them to be able to meet these needs. Um, you know, I, I would obviously say, you know, be patient with them. Um, but, you know, the two, the two of the three large ones uh, in the industry are ramping up, uh, you know, developers to be able to, to implement not only the changes here, but the, the changes in Hotma as well. Um, and as I said, you know, I, we, we don't recommend a, 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 um, a party, but, you know, what I always tell people is that if, if someone's good to you and, and has great customer service and you guys are happy with that, then, you know, stick with that one. Those are the, that's, that's, that's what always seems to be the driver uh, for, for, uh, you know, if people like their software or not, is it, is if their customer service is good. Um, but as I said, you know, the, the powers that be are, are ready. Um, it's just going to be once these things are all finalized, um, you know, how long is it going to take them to develop? But um, that's, that's kind of the best advice I can give at this point. And I think that's a good a larger point of you do not need to use the HUD software. It's an option. You can continue with your software program. And on the HCV side, you most likely will do that um, because, you know, they have everything else built out in there, the noticing and all that kind of stuff. Um, our agency still uses paper forms for both HQS and UPCS inspections, and the inspection reinspection dates and notes are inputted into our software system. These dates are then submitted to PIC for CMAP. Will paper forms still be acceptable, or will electronic tablet inspections be mandatory for submission? If so, what are the electronic options and programs for HQS and UPCS to transition to Inspire? And I, I think Andrew actually kind of touched on this. Uh, the slide was uh, given to me. I'm not sure 
uh, think Ashley or Andrew could equally handle it, but um, pay performs, to the best of my knowledge, and please correct me, Ashley, if I'm wrong, HUD is not prescribing how you conduct the inspection, only that you conduct the inspection according to the standard. That is not changed. That's program. Um, for HCV, you are conducting your inspections, your reinspections to pass fail, your reinspections, 24 hour versus 30 days, no shows, terminations, abatements, all of your program pieces stay exactly the same. Your uh, submissions, uh, your CMAP requirements, all of that stays unchanged. So to the best of my knowledge, HUD is not suggesting that you have to conduct your inspection um, in a mobile solution, that you can if you have a form and you want to conduct the form and you continue to follow your program, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, some agencies have built their own operating system. They did not build out a mobile application, so they may be able to use the app, export that data, put it into their own custom uh, operating system, and that's perfectly acceptable. With respect to UPCS, the only requirement you don't have to, when you're doing your pre-react inspections, there's nothing that says you have to report back to HUD on your pre-react, You only that you do your pre-react. Uh, the only issue is when you have your react audit, you will be required to report back to HUD or react um, mitigation measures for both 24-hour and 30-day repairs. So you would need to work within the app at that point in time that HUD is providing for free uh, to be able to report that back. They may also have a paper solution uh, where you can mail in your response. I have not seen anything on that yet. So um, I think that answers the you question. If yeah. not, okay. And just to, since CMAP is in there for FAS and CMAP, that new scoring notice talks a little bit about FAS and how Inspire is going to interact with FAS. It's not a big change, right? It's still mm -hmm. a component of your FAS score. It's still based on 100 points. But if you want to dig into FAS for public housing, that is in there. And then for CMAP, HUD is revising CMAP this year, um, not just for this, for other reasons. Um, but CMAP will take into account that the inspection standard obviously is going to go from HCV to Inspire, just as a side note. Um, is there training or a step-by-step -step guide for the reporting of Inspire? Is this one mine? Yes, I think so. Um, so Michael mentioned HUD is going to put out YouTube videos at some point that walk you through um, the updated protocols. Right now, there are some trainings online. Obviously, those are still on proposed standards, though. They're not finalized. Um, so HUD will put out YouTube videos. Nan McKay, as I said earlier, is going to have Inspire training as well. Um, and so that will walk you through each of the standards, as well as the high-level stuff that we talked about here. Um, as far as a step-by-step -step guide on Inspire, the standards themselves um, are meant to be your guide for Inspire, right? So each one is structured the same way as Michael showed you. Um, and they walk you through exactly what you need to know about each standard. So rather than like having a guidebook, essentially you could print out the standards and that is your, in, your Inspire guide. All right, and then the final question, because we have just a few minutes, um, how do we explain request weather deferral for such things as concrete work that are required in 30 days, but it's the middle of winter or the location is currently in the middle of a construction project next door? So I think this is my, um... And I love this question because uh, weather-related extensions within the HCV programs is standard there. If you're in Chicago or in cold environments and you have a paint issue, a concrete issue, you obviously cannot make that repair. So it is standard practice uh, for agencies within those geographic areas to certain times of the year to grant weather-related extensions. That remains unchanged for HCV. Where I find this question interesting really is more about public housing because prior to Inspire, there was no reinspection requirement. There was no need to grant a weather-related extension because there was no repair time requirement with the exception of life-threatening exigent repairs. So this has not been tested uh, because Inspire A is being rolled out. Uh, it only impacts public housing because HCV remains unchanged. And uh, But it would be my expectation based on uh, conversations that now that there is a reinspection mitigation requirement, that the ability to grant those weather related extensions will extend to public housing. Um, and I would expect that that would need to be addressed within your administrative plan, just as it typically is for HCV. ACOP, ACOP. ACOP. Okay. So you're the yeah, expert. Talk about this in the last one, but the, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you've got in your, in your uh, admin plan um, currently for weather related uh, extensions or deferrals, um, you would just mirror that language in, in an ACOP. Absolutely. And then, yeah. And then on the public housing side, it's going to be up to HUD to tell you that essentially, right? So, 
Um, there's a good question in the chat I just want to address for a second. Will the new system be compatible since PIC is being revamped? So Tyra brings up PIC. I just want to say to the audience, if you didn't have enough going on in your life with Inspire and Hotma and learning those things, um, PIC is now becoming HIP, which is another amazing acronym. Um, and all the software vendors are very, very well aware that PIC is becoming HIP. They're working with HUD, testing file submissions and all of that. So yes, HUD is aware of this. How that's going to roll out, um, we will have to wait and see. And that's a, a headache uh, probably for your software vendor more than anyone else. But um, yes, at some point, this will all be compatible and all work together. Um, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. I want to first of all say thank you very much for joining us. Second of all, this presentation will be posted to NAMIKE's website um, within the next week or so. So if you'd like to watch the recording of it, uh, we will have it up there for you. Um, and then stay tuned for additional trainings because we'll do more housing help sessions. And then, like I said, we will roll out our full Inspire training. Um, so with that, anything else from our panelists? I just thank you for taking the time. Obviously, you know, these are big changes. Uh, we're excited to be kind of in the front of them. And uh, as I said, we will continue to pro provide guidance and training, anything else you hopefully you would need. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone.